I hope you brought your Bibles today. We're going to continue our study in the book of Ephesians. This is part five, and uh, we're excited about it in Jesus' name. If you got, did you everybody get a bulletin and get a, did have a little outline inside there? Are you going to follow along with us? And uh, the part that you fill in will appear on the screen before you, and I'll try to remember what to show you what they are. Uh, but the title of today's sermon is, What Not to Wear. What Not to Wear. Hallelujah. Speaking of T.J. Maxx, you know. Because, I mean, there's just some things you're just not supposed to wear. You know what I'm talking about? There's this, as a matter of fact, there's this one lady, this one little girl. She kept sneaking out of the house wearing short shorts. And her mom and dad would get on to her about wearing the short shorts. Oh, but mom, all the other kids are doing it, you know. And the kids do that. And she, and she would hide her shorts in her backpack. And she'd sneak out there or that. Or she'd kind of flip them down, you know, all that stuff that girls do. And her dad says, I'm telling you right now, you, don't, you need to quit doing that. And so one day he went to school to pick up his daughter dressed up like this. Yeah. <laughs> Best dad ever. That little girl started dressing like a nun the next day. No, oh, I mean, know a little girl, ah! and he picks her up and goes inside and waves at her. There's great stuff like that. Oh, you know, there's other things in your closet you're not supposed to wear. Does anybody know what a snuggie is? Remember those things? Come you know, was it snug? Yeah, snug, a snuggie. You know, show me that. Anybody remember those? Come on, you got one in there, you know, just in case it gets cold or something like that. It's, there's all kinds of stuff in there. I mean, you know, it's even, even face masks and stuff like that. There's just some face masks you're not supposed to wear, you know, like, like this one. <laughs> it's the silence of the lambs. And I don't know how much good that's going to work, but uh, Hannibal Lecter was, was inspired by that. And, and uh, there's just some things you're not supposed to wear. Well, in the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul tells us there's some things that we're supposed to put uh, to put on, and there's some things that we're supposed to take off. And this is just—I love this part of the gospel of Jesus, of, of the gospel of, that Paul tells us about—is because Paul is going to help us with our spiritual attire. Chapter four is when the book of Ephesians begins to transition. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, and Ephesians chapter 3, the first first half of the book, it shares what God has done for us. It shares what God has done for us, and the last half shares what God wants us to do for Him. So, the first half of the book, and it's on your outline there. Shares what God has done for us. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. The God, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Glory to God. God give them spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of who you are. We are his masterpiece, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And this is just a wonderful thing. But, but Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 5, and Ephesians chapter 6 lets us know what God wants us to do for him by allowing what he did in us work through us in the, in, in the way that we live our life our walking, our lifestyle, the application of the Word of God to everyday life. Hallelujah. These are the works that follow salvation. The works that follow salvation. You see, we live holy as a reflection of our relationship with God, not to achieve one. We, we live holy as a reflection of our relationship with God, not to achieve a relationship. You achieve a relationship with God by faith in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we love holy because we want our life to reflect what God has done on the inside of us. We want our life to reflect who God is and what he's done for us and who he is for us. It's not a duty. It's not an obligation. It's our love and adoration to God. Not because we have to, but because we've allowed the gospel and the grace of God to do a work on the inside of us. Now we want to to, because it's from the goodness of God. For all that God did for me in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, I want to live a life that reflects who God is for me. I want to live a life that reflects who he is. And I don't want anything in my life to be a a blocking of God's empowering me to prosper in every area of my life. How many know when you begin to live a life free from sin, 
you begin to cooperate with the covenant instead of working against that covenant. Yes, God forgives us. Yes, he remembers our sins no longer. But sin will kill you, folks. It will keep you out of God's best. So today we're going to look at chapter 4 and 5. Uh, let's start reading Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord... I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. These are instructions for Christian living. Look at uh, chapter 17 through 19, and we're still reading in the ESV. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do. Now Gentiles are simply people that don't have a covenant with God. In the futility of their mind. If something is futile, that means it's worthless. It's empty. It leads nowhere. It only leads to darkness. I'm going to read that again. Now this I say, verse 17, and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as peop- like people that don't have a covenant. Here's how they walk, in the futility of their mind. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. So, Let's put this down in your notes. One of the greatest challenges in the church, both then and now, is Christians who live like sinners. That's the greatest challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Everything that you put your hand to prospers. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now let what God's done in you, let it live through you so that you let your light shine before all men that they will see your good works, they'll see your behavior, and they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. You don't live good to get good. You live good because God's good. Can you say amen? You don't live good to get God to love you. You, you, live good, you live good because God loves you. And that's the outgrowth of that working of the gospel on the inside of you. Glory to God. Paul, didn't tell, Paul wouldn't tell us not to walk as sinners do unless at times Christians walked and looked and acted like sinners. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. Nobody is more miserable than a Christian that still lives like a sinner. They just, they're miserable people. At least sinner can enjoy sinning. But it's like Lot. The Bible says in, in, in the, I think it's first or second, third John, it says Lot, while living among Sodom and Gomorrah, his righteous soul was tormented because he'd saw the gospel in, in his father Abraham, his uncle Abraham, and he's watching the very opposite of it there. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't belong in the world. You don't look like the world. You don't sound like the world. The world is not in you. There is no darkness in you. The light of God is on the inside of you right now. And what fellowship has light with darkness? The Bible says to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now, I used to hear, hear like, preach like this. You need to come out from among them and be separate because if you don't, God's going to squash you like a bug. You're going to go straight to hell and you're not pass go to not collect $200, go straight to hell. But you may be on your way to heaven, but you don't have to go through hell here on this earth. You can have a little bit of heaven right here on this earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Why? As we pray, God, the will of God be done in my life. And the way you pray that is that you cooperate with what God's done in you and for you. Let's look at verse 22 and 24 of Hebrews 4, of Ephesians 4. 22 through 24 says, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God into true righteousness and holiness. The Amplified Bible says in verse 22, strip yourselves of your former nature, 
put off and discard your old unrenewed self, which is characterized, it was characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust and desires that spring from delusion. So you take off the old clothes. You trade your old lifestyle for a new lifestyle. We often imitate the unbeliever, but carnal Christians, it's time that you begin to find a believer that you can look at and say, I want to model that person right there. I like the way their family looks. I like the way their finances look. I like the results of their life and begin to look at how they live. What do they do when they sit down to supper? What do they do when they get together with their family? What do they do? Not just the Instagram part. You've got to get to know one another so we can begin to emulate one another as we follow Christ Jesus our Lord and spend time in this book renewing your mind. What's this now? Our mind is the closet where we choose what we will wear daily. Our mind is the closet where we choose what we will daily wear. Those two of them. But the first one is your mind is the closet. And in that closet, you choose what you will daily wear. That's why you've got to be careful what you put in this mind. Your spirit man is born again by the blood of Jesus. And then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now you are perfect on the inside. You have been made one spirit with God and you are joint heirs with him. Now the battle for the rest of your life until you go to heaven is to begin to renew your mind so you no longer think like your old self, so you no longer think like NBC, ABC, CBS, MNS, BBC, and CNN, and Fox News. You are to renew your mind until you think like Jesus, act like Jesus, look like Jesus. That's why I'm encouraging you to do your best to get the New Testament read between now and and uh we started back a few weeks ago so don't panic if you first got here (laughs) people started back in may uh getting your mind ready to read the entire new covenant through before july 4th gets here why because this nation needs a revival and they don't need christians standing up and acting like the world and spewing out their doubt and their fear and unbelief we're supposed to be light in a dark place when we stand up at a town hall meeting when we stand up on tuesday at 1 30 when the county commissioners get together and you've got something to say you're supposed to leave the venom at the door you're supposed to leave the hatred at the door you're supposed to leave the snarky ugly talk that looks good on on news channels it looks good sometimes when other people do it but ladies and gentlemen you gotta remember when you stand up you represent the kingdom of god you represent the church of our lord jesus christ you represent my god and father and you represent me because everybody knows you're a believer praise the lord hallelujah Get up there, and, and when you stand to state your case, well, make sure that you can say it with Jesus Christ sitting right there on the front row, and you not have a problem with it. And folks, you can speak the truth in love. Can you say amen? Let that truth come out of you, glory to God, and do that. But renew your mind. We've, we've have been called to live in a righteousness and holiness. The transformation of what we shall wear is centered and focused around the mind. Our spirit has been made alive unto God, but our flesh, our carnal nature, still dwells within us. In our soul and mind, it is our soul and mind that will determine what life path that we take. Look at Romans 8 and 6 and 8. Romans 8. 6 and 8. Do you love the word? Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 and 8. Hallelujah. Oh, here it is. For to set your mind on the flesh is death. Dang. See, it's not like you set your mind on the flesh, you're going to have a bad day. Set your mind on the flesh... It's going to be a Monday type of day to set your mind on your flesh, your five physical senses, what your unrenewed self wants is death, but to set your mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. And we know under the new covenant, God's laws are God's laws of love. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, 
but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, you He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells on the inside of you. How do you tap into that Spirit life that raised Jesus from the dead? By renewing your mind and let your mind cooperate with the work that's already been done on the inside of you. That's good preaching, Brother Tim. Thank you very much. Glory to God. Carnally minded is death. Spiritual mind is life. Set your mind on life. Your thought life is the womb of all your future actions. Living holy has now become a part of your nature. And because you've renewed your mind, it doesn't feel like you're trying to be somebody else. You think like God thinks now. You act like God thinks now. And you get used to being light in a dark place. And the world doesn't understand it. They're not, they're not going to appreciate it. But it's, but it's a choice what I do. It's not the fault of my parents. It's not the fault of my teachers. It's not the fault of my circumstances. My life is based on the decisions that I have made. But I'm a victim. I was wrong, born the wrong class. I was born the wrong color. I don't have the education somebody has. I didn't have the opportunity some other people have. But you can take, folks, when you say that kind of stuff, you're negating the, pro, the, the power of the decision that you make based on the Word of God. The grass withers, the flower thereof fades, but the Word of my God will stand forever. And you can take this Word of God and begin to make decisions based on that and overcome every obstacle known to man. You can overcome every obstacle, every every hindrance, every legacy passed down from generations. You are not a product of your mom and dad. You're a product of your born again spirit and you've got the word of God now to make decisions based on that resurrected spirit. And folks, that's the way God gets all the glory. And Joseph... Joseph did not ask to be put in the pit. He didn't ask to have knuckleheads for brothers. But they put him in the pit. But he didn't get bitter against his brother. He kept forgiveness for for them. And all of a sudden, the Bible says a caravan came over the hillside. And they sold him into slavery instead of having him killed in that pit. Can I tell you something? It was a highway caravan. A caravan was camels and donkeys and horses loaded down with all kinds of good. And there was a great scores of them because there was protection that from bandits. When you go to get rid of a body, you don't go out here to the rest area just south of, you know, 995 and next to the water fountain, bury the body there. Where do you go? You go out there with this chickers and gators and all those things. You go out there where nobody ever comes out here, and this is a good place to be. Tell the Tim, you thought this through. <laughs> I watched the law of law and order. <laughs> and don't put it in a dumpster. That's the first place they look. You know, it's always the garbage cans sitting there, and they're talking about the ball game. Oh, my God. And they call doing it. They were putting Joseph out there to die. But all of a sudden, a caravan gets off Interstate 95, goes down Babcock Street, turns a left on this dirt road, have no idea why they're going that way. Why? Because the hand of the Lord knew that Joseph was going to be there and they could sell, they would use their covetousness to sell them and keep them alive. And then he gave Prosper as a slave and came in charge of this rich man's entire estate. And a woman lied about him and told stories on him and they had him put in prison. He did nothing wrong, but he kept his heart pure before the Lord. And while he was in prison, they put him in charge of the prison. He was in charge of everything that went on in that prison. And he interpreted two dreams and lo and behold, one day Pharaoh, the greatest man on the planet, the, the leader of the free world is in trouble. He has his dream and Joseph is called to interpret that dream. And within 24 hours, he goes 
goes from being in the prison to being prime minister of the greatest nation on the planet at that time in charge of the entire wealth of the world. People came from all over the world to get the wealth right there. You've got to quit making excuses for your background. You've got to, don't listen to what the news media is telling you about this, that, and this, this, and, that, and they got this privilege and they got that privilege. Folks, you've got gospel privilege. The gospel privilege means that if I can speak, say, say with my mouth and confess with my heart that Jesus is Lord, I can become a born again man and I'm no longer of this world, but I'm of a higher world. I don't think on the level the world thinks. I think on the level that he thinks glory to God and I live a life that is a billboard of the mercy of God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I'm preaching good today. (laughs) Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in God, which is your spiritual worship. The way you live your life is a form of worship to God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. And that was the scripture I was going to send you if I had not remembered when I saw you right there about the will of God. Glory to God. I thought I'd tell you. Hallelujah. Look at Romans 13, 12. 12 through 14. Hallelujah. You're going to like this. Romans 13, 12. The night is far gone and the day is at hand. So then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify desires. So you take off the works of darkness and you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 again. Therefore put away falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Let's just... Let's just deal with political stuff. And you can be a left-leaning person and go to this church. You can be a right-leaning person and go to this church. You can be Democrat, Republican. We're an interdenominational church. You know what that means? You can be Baptist and come here. I don't know. You probably won't stay Baptist very long, but you can be Methodist and come here. (laughs) She come all shy. And you can see it now, whether you're left leaning leaning or right leaning, do you see things on the news at night that make you angry? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I used to read about Elvis Presley shooting his television. Yeah, I get it. It's dumb, you don't get to watch TV the rest of the night, but uh, but you can be angry and not sin. You can be angry and stay in love. You can be angry and ask God, God, show me these people that are doing things, whether left or right, Democrat, Republican, Methodist or Baptist. Show me how you see them. Let me, let me love them with the love of God that's on the inside of me. Because, God, I know I'm not perfect and you still love me. My sins just aren't on in front of cameras. But I can be angry and sin not. Verse 27, why? Give no opportunity to the devil. 
Now, I'm going to stop right here for just a moment. Give no opportunity to the devil. The devil's defeated. Amen. He's underneath your feet. The devil lost his power the day he, Jesus said it is finished and when God raised him again from the dead. Jesus said, all power and authority has been given to me both in heaven and in earth. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Are you listening to me? So the devil has no place in your life because of the blood of the Lamb. But the Bible says, give no opportunity to the devil. Why? By being angry and sinning. By getting over in the five physical senses instead of having your mind renewed to find out how would Jesus act in these type of situations? How would God respond in these type of situations? Are you listening to me? You see, when you don't... <laughs> let's keep reading. That's just good stuff. Ephesians 4. This is put away falsehoods. Verse 25. Let each one speak the truth in love. It just works. Can I speak some truth to you? No, I'm not going to go there. First Thessalonians 4.11. You'd, so, you'd be so pleased with me. You know, If you knew what I was wanted to say and what I didn't say, you would think, Pastor, you really did great. But you'll never know because I didn't say it. First Thessalonians 4.11. Eleven and 12 says, And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. And to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and depend be dependent upon no one. You know, a lot of people you see causing problems, if they had jobs they went to every day, they wouldn't have the strength to do some of the stuff they do. I'm just saying. Second Thessalonians three six says that was first Thessalonians, this is second Thessalonians three six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know that you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But, the, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we did not have the right, but to give you in yourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but their work quietly to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Hallelujah. Brother Tim, I'm retired. I've worked all my life. You can be retired and not be idle. Does that make sense? You can be busy, volunteering, doing something. If you want something to do, come see me. I'm going to tell you, if you're having problems with your thought life, get busy doing life. And you won't have time to think like you used to think. You'll still have thoughts in your mind, but that idle mind, just idling the day away. How much golf can you play? How much fishing can you do? How much shopping can you do? There needs to be find some purpose that I'm still breathing on this planet. And yes, I'm going to enjoy my retirement. Yes, I'm going to enjoy this. But I've got a purpose to be here. Show me, God, what my place is in the kingdom of God and get busy doing it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And I'm kind of wrapping this thing up. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for the building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Is what you're saying going to give grace to the person that hears it? 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Chapter 5 verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us. And gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Hallelujah. Nothing pleases the Father more than having his kids look like him, act like him, and talk like him. I like that. You've heard me say this before. Maybe, but I remember my dad would get, you know what a rototiller is? You say it different from the South. We call it a rototiller. It's all together. A rototiller, it spins and cuts up the ground and cuts up the groots and things like that. And my dad would get that rototiller. We'd give him time, springtime in Tennessee to get that ground all ready. And he would still have his work boots on because he'd be doing it in the evening. And he'd be walking behind that rototiller. And I remember being probably three or four-year-old boy, four-year-old, five-year-old, something like that. I remember wanting to put my footprints in my daddy's footprints. I had to go like this. And, of course, my foot's about this big and his is about that big. And doing like that. I remember, remember back before we had air conditioners and you'd roll down your windows and it was hot. And my dad would put his hand up on the civil, steering wheel and put his arm out the window. So I'm sitting over in the passenger. We didn't have car seats, forgive us. Our car seats was when they'd come to a stop, they'd put their hand in front of us like this. <laughs> my dad would put his arm out like that, and I'd do like this. I got my, why? I want to be like my father. I want to do him, be like him. Folks, that's what this Bible is for. It's a way to learn to imitate your father. Can you say amen? So how do you imitate God? Write these things down. Spend time with God and his people. God, God's people church daily look into the mirror of his word check your reflection look in the mirror of his word and say is the way I'm living lining up with what I see happening in this Bible right here the third one is mimic his behavior mimic his behavior do what God's called you to do and uh, I've already read verses 3 through 4 in Ephesians Sexual jokes, crude humor. It's not funny, folks. It's a cheap form of, of humor. Can I tell you something else? The lowest form of humor is sarcasm. And I have to watch that because I can, I can go sarcastic like that. Why? Because I see everything as funny and I want to make fun of everything. I, see, I just see things. And uh, remember that comedian that was on... That made fun of Christian stuff all the time. Was it John Christ? I think like that. Uh, anyway, he was all the time on there. He's making fun. They make fun of Chick Fil A and make fun of church. It was it was hilarious. He was he was raised in church. He was homeschooled, and he made homeschool jokes and kids and school jokes. And, and you could tell he was raised around the same environment that we were. But that man is no longer doing Christian comedy because he got caught up in a lifestyle of sin. Because you can't live your life sitting in the seat of the scorner and live a victorious life. When you catch yourself that scornful, cynical thing, I mean, some of you, I'm looking back at a prison guard back here. I, mean, I can tell you, somebody that really needs to double up on the Word of God because you're sitting, you sit around there, and you have to be cynical to keep from just get your heart getting hard. Just you get this callous, gallows humor. Just to deal with because of the, of the people that you deal with all day. But man, if you've got a job where you're around the world, you've got to double up on your time. On the way to work, listen to the Word of God. On the way home, listen to the Word of God. Why? Because, folks, you can't let yourself sit in the seat of the scornful or sit in the way of sinners, but you must delight yourself in the law of the Lord. In His law, you must meditate day and night, and then He will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Glory to God. Isn't He good? He is so wonderful. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Keep away from everything 
that even looks like sin. So let me write this down. Our holiness is a beacon of the light in a very dark world. Let's look at 1 Timothy, 1 Peter 2, 11. 1 Peter 2, 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when you speak, when they speak against you as evil doers, they may see your good deeds and glorify the God on the day of visitation. Does anybody know who Michael Pence is? Mike Pence, the president, vice president of the United States. There used to be something called the Billy Graham rule. What was the Billy Graham rule? I will never be in the room alone with a woman that is not my wife. So Mike Pence adopted the Billy Graham rule. Now they call it the Mike Pence rule. And in the, rule, in the world of Me Too and sexual scandal... The, our, the President of the United States made up his mind. I will never be in alone in a room with a woman that is not my wife. There must be another per, other people there present with us to go, you know. And if I have to be alone with a woman, my wife has to be there with me. They raked him through the car. Ah, that's the craziest thing. That's sexist. That's this. That's that. Uh, folks, that's holy and that's righteous. And so, you know, Mike Pence didn't defend it. So basically he said, if you're going to criticize me, criticize me for being righteous. How many know it's time that we start getting criticized for being righteous instead of getting criticized because we got caught in sin? Don't live your life so, so close to the edge that all it takes is one bad day and one wrong thought and one thing. You fall over the edge. You've heard me say this before. How many of you know every year somebody falls into the Grand Canyon trying to get a best selfie, they get on the edge, and they fall in the canyon, and usually about uh, anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen people die a year in the Grand Canyon because they got too close. But you have never heard of anybody staying in Melbourne, Florida, falling from Melbourne, Florida into the Grand Canyon and dying. Why? Because this is about as far away from the Grand Canyon as you can get. Folks, make up your mind. I want to live so close to God's law that if I stumble and fall, I'm way from the edge. I'm way from that place over there. My stumbling and falling is I'm caught in the arms of my Lord. He protects me and keeps me. And I don't become a a disgrace to my family. I don't become a disgrace to my church. I don't become a, 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 I don't want to be that. I want my life to be lived in a way where my children and my grandchildren, they let me tell you about Paul and how he lived his life. He was a good man. Amen? Hallelujah. Let wholeness be a beacon. Galatians 5.1 says, In this freedom Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held and ensnared and submit again to the rogue yoke of slavery which you have once put off. Don't go back and put on what you once put off. Don't go back and put on what you once just got set free from. In your notes, let me finish. We live holy to defend our relationship with God, not to achieve one. We live holy to defend our relationship with God and not to achieve one. Not duty, not obligation but love and adoration. Ephesians 4.14 says, For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then on how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your hearts, giving thanks always for everything and to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I believe the last thing on your outline is a heart of worship keeps our life focused in the right direction. You can't fake it in worship. It's bare. It's raw. Worship is exposing our heart to his heart. Worship is somewhat naked and vulnerable. But my goodness, when you open yourself up and get real to God and begin to worship him with everything that's in you, it does something on the inside of you. When the praise team opens up the service in praise and worship, that's not, that's not the warm-up time to get ready for the preaching. It's doing something in your heart. It, the Bible says that Judah means praise, and also Judah plows. Praise and worship begins to plow and get your heart ready to receive the, in, the incorruptible seed of God's Word in your heart and on your mind. So we're going to do that this morning. I don't want you to stand up and make a vow and say, I promise this week I'm going to be good like I've never been good. So help me God. Because you know, dude, the moment, very moment that you just make up your mind, I'm going to be good, glory to God. I'm not going to sin. You're fixing to mess up so bad. <laughs> How many of y'all going to start a diet Monday? <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, you know what? We're going to, you know, it's Sunday. You know, we do go out to eat. We've worked hard all day. Monday. That's when we're going to, we're going to write that stuff down. We're gonna. And the moment you say that you're going to do better, I'm going to do better. I'm going to, I'm going to fast the next three days. You're fixing to eat 37 of the biggest meals of your entire life. <laughs> Unless you depend on God. God, you know how much I love food. You know how I need food. I need you to help me by your grace, God, if you'll help me today. I'll not let food cross my lips until I hear from you on this certain situation and rely and depend totally on the grace of God. The fasting is not about going without food. It's about depending on him instead of stuffing your feelings down and your emotions down with food. You expose your feelings, your emotion to a God that loves you and cares about you, and he's the only one that can really help you. In Jesus' name.